codes. The following paper by Neil and my Ukrainian colleague, Dimitri Pesenko, is about the archaeological situation in the Ukraine during World War II, when the country was under German civil <coughs> administration and was known as Reichskommissariat Ukraine. At that time, the numerous Ukrainian museums and archaeological sites on the lower river course of the Dnieper and also on Crimea were playing fields of German archaeologists. These were employers from two competed scientific organizations, the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, <coughs> shortly called IRR, and the Anerbe of the SS. The paper focuses mainly on the archaeologists of the Rosenberg Task Force, especially the Austrian prehistorian Walter Modria. The basis of this lecture are documents from various archives, including the Federal Archives in Berlin, the Lake Dwelling Museum in Berlin, the Universal Museum in Berlin and Graz, and the Central State Archive of the Supreme Bodies of Power and Government of Ukraine in Kiev. At the beginning, I want to introduce briefly the former rivals. First, the from Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Wirth in 1935 founded Ahnenerbe, formed as a kind of Academy of Sciences for the SS under the leadership of Wolfram Siebers. The Ahnenerbe should provide the scientific proof of the supremacy of the Aryan race by research and organized archaeological and anthropological research and expeditions. On the other side, there was the Rosenberg Task Force. It was a kind of plunder organization of the NSDAP for cultural goods in the occupied countries, which was under the direction of Alfred Rosenberg, who was since 1941 also head of the Reich Ministry for Occupied Eastern Territories. In the ERR consists of several special staffs called Sonderstäbe, including one for pre and early history, which was led by Hans Reinhardt, a Berlin professor and head of the department prehistory in Amt Rosenberg. The ERR was active throughout Europe and towards the course of the war. Once an era was conquered and pacified by the Wehrmacht, the Rosenberg Task Force followed and started to secure the cultural institutions such as museums, libraries and archives. Depending on the situation, the objects were sifted and made accessible locally again or transported to the German Reich for evaluation. An employee of the Rosenberg Task Force in Ukraine was Walter Mudra. He was born in 1911 in Klavfurt, Carinthia. In 1938, he completed his studies of pre- and early history in Graz. This was followed by a study of geodesy in Bruno, today Czech Republic. As early as 1932, he had joined the Nazi party, which he left again in 1933 because of the ban of the party in Austria. In 1938, he made a new application for readmission to the NSDAP, which was approved in 1940. Because of his special education as geodesist and technical draftsman, his good knowledge of foreign languages like French and Italian, Modern got a job at the Reichsamt für Vorgeschichte in Berlin and became part of the ERR staff. In the sequel, Modern worked as geodesist and archaeologist for the ERR until 1944, alternately in France the Soviet Union and Italy, as you can see on this map. Of particular importance for research are his measurements of the Breton megaliths around Karnak in 1940 and 1942. These are high precision plans which display the kilometer long alignments and also smaller dolmen. Some drawings, such as those of the alignments of Keles Khan, were also published in 1942. Also, of this book was the prehistorian Werner Hülle, the assistant of Reinhardt, who led, who led the research campaigns in Brittany and Ukraine. Motorant, as well as Hülle, working in Ukraine under the lead of Rudolf Stampfus, who became, at the end of 1941, head of the special staff for brilliant early history in the Reichskommissariat Ukraine. He established in the following year a state agency for brilliant early history in Kiev which carried out safekeepings of civil museums. The archaeological research of the Germans were strongly influenced ideologically and should justify the territorial claims of the Nazi Germany in Ukraine and legitimize scientific, scientifically the long-term occupation <coughs> by the Germans. <coughs> After German doctrine, the history of Ukraine represents a sequence of Germanic immigrations from the Indo-Europeans in the Neolithic age 
to the Vikings in the 9th century. <coughs> Every history should prove that the Germans had actually always been in the territories occupied by the German Wehrmacht and had always exercised positive impulse to the cultural, social and political life as carriers of culture. And this was also used for propaganda purposes. As you can see in this edition of the journal Germanenerbe, Herr Stampfus wrote about the Germanic tribes in the Green. Of particular importance in research obtained the migration period Goth, which were counted among the Germanic tribes. The plan was to establish a research institute for the history of the Goth and the National Museum of Pre and Early History of Crimea in Simferopol. Even the famous Gothic site of Eski Kermen and Mangu Calais in Crimea were we measured and the terrain recordings complemented with aerial photographs by the German Wehrmacht. The propagation of the Crimean goats, Titanism, also served again to justify German territorial claims. It should be established a Bodenland or a Bodenbau on Crimea where the South Tyrolean people should find a new home which were displaced by the Allied Italy. In May 1942, Motrian traveled for the first time to Green. Under the leadership of Rudolf Stampfus, the collections of local museums and scientific institutions in Kiev, as well as in major cities around the Dnieper and on Crimea, were cited and evaluated according to their significance and preservation. Photographs and drawings by Motrian documented this travel. The photos are showing mainly various touristic attractions in Kiev and some public and political buildings, as well as scenes from daily life. In addition, there is a small series of photos which displayed the quarters and the two cars of the small expedition on Crimea. There are also drawings by Modrian showing various ceramic vessels from the museums of Kherson and Simferopol. A half year later, Modrian was sent by Reinhardt again in the dream to rebuild the museum in Dnipropetrovsk and to represent the interests of the ERR in the general district. As Motrin arrived in Dnipropetrovsk on 20 September 1942, he found there were evacuated prehistoric objects from the historical museum packed in boxes at the ground floor of the nearby art museum. There he began with the new arrangement of the collections and reopened the archaeological part with museum texts in German language already in December 1942. The target group of the museum were the members of the German Wehrmacht and the representatives of the Civil Occupation Administration, which had presented here, as well as in other Ukrainian cities, the history of the country dominated by Nordic tribes. This should justify and propagate the German conquest and occupation of the Ukraine. Unfortunately, we have no pictures of the exhibition in Petrosk but we can compare, compare it with the museum in Kharkiv, which was reopened in the same year by the ER, for which we have, for example, a printed German museum guide. To check the ideological, ideological concept in the museums, Reinhardt made together with Rudolf Stampfus a journey through the occupied Ukraine between September and November 1942. The journey, the leap from Krakow to Kiev and from there along the Dnieper to the Crimea and the Caucasus. In between, the group stopped twice in Nipopetrovsk, where they visit the from Motrian supervised museum. Motrian stayed in Nipopetrovsk until April 1943 and spent the time with the graphic documentation of the local museum collections, as these examples of ceramics of the Catacomb and Srutnaya culture shows. Motrian was supported by Michael Miller, a former professor of ancient history at the University of Rostov, who carried out previously smaller researches for the Ananyade. Under Motrian, he made the graphical documentation of the metal finds. Miller was also very familiar with the archaeological sites along the Dnieper River and made detailed archaeological maps of the river course between Dnipropetrovsk and Zaporozhye. After blasting the dam of the Dnieper-Stroy hydroelectric power plant near the city of Zaporozhye in 1941 by Soviet troops, many archaeological sites along the riverside get visible. The ERR want to secure these sites for themselves and organized 
a first research expedition to prospect the Dnieper River side of the boat in May 1943. This survey was conducted by Werner Hülle and Walter Rothern, who could locate at multiple sites washed out remains of ancient settlements and cemeteries. They put their main focus on the Gothic sites. Three of them were chosen for possible excavations. One of these sites was located near the village of Novo Alexandrovka. Between early June till the end of August 1943, Hülle and Motwen explored their two stone settings, setting, settings with several Bronze Age crouched inhumations and uncovered several Gothic cremation and skeleton worlds. Apparently disappointed by the financial possibilities of the ERR, Miller already was con has contacted in March 1943 the Arnhem and proposes a more archaeological expedition to the Dnieper of Spore. The Arnhem Ever takes his proposal, and Miller was since May 1943 an official employee of the Arnhem Ever. Miller's first order was the creation of a catalogue of Gothic and Norman finds in southern Russia. Additionally, he should arrange a large excavation expedition to the Dnieper of Spore for the Arnhem Ever. For this purpose, he prospects sites and makes small excavations between Saporosha and Nikopo in June and July 1943, which he documented in a map. There, he also may have discovered his migration period burial at Nikos Koye, with bronze beads and cross shaped pendant, as you can see here. In June and July 1943, S officers and non Air employees Karl Kersten and Herbert Jankun arrived in Nikopetrovsk to inquire Miller about the status of his researchers and initiate further excavations in the Dnieper Oxford. However, they arrived too late. At this time, the ERR had already confiscated all promising sites on the Dnieper River site and carried out first excavations. An order to the Commissioner of the region of Dnieper-Petrovsk, Klaus Seitzner, made it possible that the Arnhem Erbe starts archaeological excavations with Dutch and Danish researchers like Franz Christian Bosch and Wilhelm Jan de Vaughan in Solone, south southwest of Dnieper-Petrovsk, and Sir in Nikos Kolle. The researches in Solone took place from June to September 1943 at three burial mounds, but the desired Germanic remains didn't appear. The excavations in Solone were the only German excavations which are published and documented well with plans and photographs. Also, the Rosenberg task force tried to publish their researches as soon as possible, but these works are not printed caused by the paper shortage from 1944. As an example, I show the proofs of two papers by Modran for the Germanenberg. In this paper, Smotran wrote about the contact points between Greek and Germanic colonization in Ukraine and provides all of the maps, therefore. When Kiev and Nikol Petrovsk was treated, treated by the Red Army, the era was starts from the end of September 1943 with the hurried transport of Ukrainian museum collections, archaeological finds, and libraries. Their journey leads from Kiev via Krakow to the Bavarian castle Richtet. Among them, there are 57 boxes with the findings from Hülle's and Motren's excavation. We know for sure that they arrived in Krakow at the middle of November, but after that we have lost the traces. Mostly unclear is also the further stay of Motren. It seems that he was involved actively in shifting cultural objects, archives and libraries from Ukraine into the German Reich. Then, further orders of the ERR bring Motren to the Odilian Berg in Elsass and to Northern Italy. In September 1944, he was finally called to the Wehrmacht. On the 2nd of May of 1945, he was captured in no northern Germany by English forces and released in the same summer to Austria. He could continue his archaeological career in 1949 after legislative changes. He became an employee of the UNIM in Graz and finally director of his museum and university teacher in Graz and Salzburg. Modrian died on 18th October 1981. At the end, the question should be answered which legacy the German archaeology had left in Ukraine. Unfortunately, the Ukrainian colleagues know about archaeological excavations on the occupied eastern territories, mostly from contemporary researchers from Germany, Austria, Netherlands, or England. Especially in the last 15 years, there were published a large number of publications which approach this, this issue and published some new plans, photographs, and drawings, which we preserved mostly in German archives. A major part of the during uh, of the, during the end of the war displaced the Ukrainian museum collections and also the excavation finds from Hülle and Motran is today lost, with the result that, for example, Motran's drawings are the most complete collection of illustrations of archaeological pottery in the Petros Museum. After World War II, the Soviets denied all German theories and suppressed the problem of Gothic or Viking 
respectively Varangian migrations until the end of the 1980s. In this time period, the development of archaeological theories in Russia went so far that especially the Gothic remains, which today are counted in the so-called Janyakiv Kudu, were suddenly attributed to the Slavs. Despite extensive special literature, the ERR and RNF activities during the Second World War are partly disregarded in Germany until today. Like this exhibition catalogs you can see here shows where this aspect is unmentioned. But there are, of course, ex exceptions, such as large scale research projects between German and Ukrainian institutions here on the right side, which deal openly with this issue. As we see more, research and corporations in the future are necessary. Thanks for your attention.